All right, so there's a sizable literature that kind of highlights that populism is both a very pertinent and a very widespread phenomenon. We're all familiar with Gasmuller's infamous populist zeitgeist thesis, right? Uh, much of the literature that comes out of that or that has built on that um, specifically refers to populism amongst the elites or so-called uh, supply side populism. It's particularly this supply uh, of populism that is quite pervasive these days. And the measurement of that supply side phenomenon, however, is something that does not really go back as far as the claims of it, its existence uh, do. So for all intents and purposes, the measurement of it is something that's relatively new. The literature advances numerous ways to measure populism amongst the elites. And I'm having a conversation today with Saskia Ruth-Lovell to talk about one particular way to do exactly that, namely by relying on elite surveys. So first of all, Saskia, before we get into details and specifics, can you give us some more information on what exactly an elite survey is? Yes. So hi, uh, students. Um, my name is Saskia Ruslavel. I'm an assistant uh, professor of political science at Radboud University. And uh, I know Stephen from several conferences and of course also from uh, working on similar topics. And um, yeah, so I work with elite surveys um, to measure populism. Um, Stephen already mentioned the supply side. So we have dem the demand side of populism and the supply side of populism. And we have a lot of information on uh, the, the demand side yet. Um, and we also have some information on the supply side. So there have been measures out there that look at, for example, very important politicians like presidents or chief executives. So we get some measures of the supply side. We also get party manifestos, which are sometimes coded. Um, but those are very specific, um, singular, um, text-based um, analysis or measurements, which, um, which give you insight into a very specific aspect of the supply side. And what is often missing is looking at parliamentarians, for example, or political candidates. And this in a, in a broader spectrum, so not just at the one political leader that stands out, that is very often mentioned in the press, but at the everyday parliamentarian who is maybe part of a populist party as we define it uh, in some way. So getting at this with a more fine-grained um, measurement, that's where elite surveys can come in. And um, so elite surveys are actually similar to expert surveys. They just look at a very specific type of expert and that's parliamentarians or political candidates who are a very specific group of interviewees you can, you can look at or at survey respondents you can look at. And um, elite surveys try to get um, kind of a representative picture of the distribution of political parties within a parliament or within an electoral race, then it would be a candidate survey. If you do it um, within a parliamentary period, parliamentary period, then it would be a parliamentary survey. But both of them are called elite surveys. Depends a little bit on um, the, the the kind of um, sample you're looking at has some differences. In one instance, it's already elected individuals, and in the other instance, it's those who try to become elected. But they can share a very specific perspective on many topics we might be interested in, not just populism. Um, it's really um, interesting to know their career trajectory, for example, an elite service can, can give you information on that. It's interesting to know their positions on political issues apart from their political party. Um, so you do not have just one measure on um, the social policy position of a political party and you assume that party is a unitary actor, for example, so every parliamentarian of this party should have the same position. No, with elite service, we can dig deeper, we can break up this black box of a political party and look at um, individual parliamentarians and see if the positions within the party are actually as unified as, as sometimes assumed. Um, so it gives us another tool to look at a specific perspective um, of populism and the measurement of populism and other questions, of course, as well. So that's a very particular kind of advantage of this measurement, right? Mm -hmm. Are there any disadvantages that people <laughs> would typically attribute to, let's say, an elite survey? 
Yes, of course. There are, um, I mean, for every method, I think this is the case right. that you have advantages and disadvantages. So, and you have to be aware of them. So which kind of systematic biases can appear in those data sets? The first one, of course, is you have to know with whom you're, uh, from whom you're getting the information. So those are political elites. Um, they are probably also interviewed about uh, specific issues or they have to respond to specific questionnaires, hope, very more often than the regular person on the street. So they are familiar with some of the concepts and also with some of the ways how social scientists ask questions. Um, and they might give you different answers than the general public, for example. So that's that's one thing you can you can think of. But so the experience so far with lead surveys is that um, they are they they are very open and also responding to these questions and um, and so far the data we get out of it also makes sense so we do not have really strong outlier cases um, in 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 those in those surveys um, another thing that's that's difficult is surveys often rely on the frequency of respondents you get. Um, so the more respondent responses you have, um, the more you can rely on the descriptors or on the analyses you, you make with them later on. And parliaments only have so many parliamentarians. So in some countries, a parliament only has 100 parliamentarians. And um, a representative sample from, of this can have instances of less than 40 cases. So with 40 cases in your survey, um, smaller parties are less represented in these elite surveys than larger parties. Um, I can give you an example later on on Bolivia. Um, I will show you graphs or in the chapter you can also find this. There are two parties which um, have a reasonable an amount of respondents to the elite survey and one party which has less than 10 responses and then the statistical possibilities you can do with the data um, yeah, get narrower and you have to really um, check the results against maybe other measures or be careful in interpreting the results. Okay, so that gives us already a very kind of general idea of what an elite survey is, what the benefits are, and what maybe some of the pitfalls are that we should keep in mind when we are using its data. So let's get a bit more specific and, and relate uh, this to populism. And specifically, the the project that you are involved in, you collaborate closely with uh, the Parliamentary Elites in Latin America project, or what is abbreviated as PELA. Uh, it's a network that focuses on the or on parliamentary elite surveys. But specifically, your role in the in the project is that you brought in the notion of populism in this kind of elite survey. So. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, PELA and your, your work with them, your role within the project? Yes, of course. Um, so I would like to share my screen for this. So let me um, change this here. Should work, hopefully. Yeah. So um, the first thing that I would like to show you is this um, web page of the project itself. So um, you, you should all see the PELA page right now. Um, so the, the, it's the parliamentary elites in Latin America survey exists already since the mid 90s. So it started as an initiative from the University of Salamanca and in particular as an initiative of one professor there, which is Professor Manuel Alcantara. And, um, and he with his interest in um, political party research and um, representation research on Latin American countries started um, interviewing or setting up this, this elite survey um, for um, different Latin American countries. In the beginning, there were not all countries included, so they expanded over time. By now, they cover um, most of Latin America. Sometimes a country drops out because um, they cannot um, administer the, the survey there. There may be some, um, some um, context conditions that lead to that. And, um, but in general, it's one of the only databases that covers um, such a large amount of countries over such a long period of time. So they were able, since the mid 90s, to cover nearly all legislative periods for most of the Latin American countries. 
And that's, that's very unique. So other elite surveys that are out there um, either cover a specific country or they cover a very specific parliament like the European parliament, for example. But we do not have such a coherent and, and over time perspective in other regions. So that's something where Latin America actually can shine with better data than other regions, which often is not the case. Mm -hmm. And um, on this webpage, so I would also encourage you if you're interested in doing empirical research with the data, you can get access to the database, you can ac get access to the different questionnaires. There's even a merged database where the um, organization themselves already um, bring the different country databases together, but you can also pick and choose the individual country databases. The data is free of charge. Um, the only thing you have to do is you have to um, plug in your information and mention a little bit what you want to do with the data. But if it's educational or if it's research, that's the usual use of um, for these data sets. And how did we measure um, populism um, with the data set? So one thing that um, I can share with you here is a short overview over the different items that were used in um, the PELA survey. They all were used with a five-point scale from um, low populist or um, do not agree or and do agree. And um, the populist, typical populist items, which you probably have seen in other studies as well, are those six items up here. So you have the um, question of the politicians in Congress need to follow the will of the people, which mirrors with this people centrism element. You have the people, not the politicians should make the most important policy decision, which also um, resonates with people centrism and popular sovereignty. Then you have um, the political differences between the people and the elite are larger than the differences among the people. This goes in the direction of this Manichaean or anti or um, black white view that the people are good, the elites are bad, and um, are separate groups within society. You also have, it is preferable to um, be represented by a citizen rather by an experienced politician, which shows you kind of the view and perspective towards politicians. So you should be um, suspicious about them because they might be corrupt. Someone from the people is someone you could trust, um, common man or common woman. Um, as a representative is better than um, someone from the elite, uh, which, which you never see in person throughout your whole life. So that's more or less what's behind those different um, items. And um, I think it doesn't make sense to read through all of them now, but just to give you an indication that they were selected based on the concept of populism um, that's behind it. And there were a few authors who pioneered these items for public opinion survey surveys. So, those items come from public opinion surveys and have been used in several countries by now. We had to adjust a few of them um, um, for the purpose of uh, political elites. And um, I think the one that was, um, was mainly changed was, uh, was this here because um, it was in the public opinion survey, I think is I would like to be represented rather by a citizen than by an um, experienced politician. And this wording wouldn't work with elites. Um, so because you speak to those people who represent, so you have to rephrase this, and rephrase this in a way that it's more general, that they can say, okay, in principle, I agree or I disagree with the statement, um, but that it's not so directly focused on asking the response of a, of a citizen in a way. One thing that's not in the paper, and paper you read, in the chapter you read, is that we also um, included pluralist and elitist attitudes in the PELA survey. Um, and those are the theoretical opposites of populism. And um, in other studies, it has been shown that those different items load also on different factors, which mean this different underlying um, meanings and um, and so that's why it's always good to have also those opposites uh, within surveys to compare um, parties across those different aspects of um, how politics is viewed um, by, um, by the specific people you're asking. And um, what did you want me to answer? Could you so how, how did you go about the actual measurement? Can you tell yeah. us something about that? Okay. So, 
So the, the nice thing about this is that the PELA already existed. So they already were an established data set. Um, I didn't work with them before I contacted them, but um, at some point I thought it would be very interesting to get these um, items um, and ask elites um, these items to see if we can match maybe also public opinion data with um, um, political elite data on the same attitude scale because this attitude scale of populism was around for quite some time at that time point and um, and it was some a really vibrant literature that worked with it but mainly in Europe and not many things in Latin America so I approached them and asked them if um, they would be willing to include some items and it and it it's well it I have to thank Pela for it or uh, Manuel Alcantara which I actually also knew before from conferences. So it's always good to connect at conferences and get um, to know the people, know what they're doing. Um, so I have to thank them that they were willing to include them so we could use this, um, this great source. Because what they do is, and this is a huge data collection effort, um, they send PhD students actually um, to each of those countries for several weeks. So four to six weeks, um, one PhD student is in charge of collecting the data for one country for one parliamentarian period. They have a structured um, interview guideline, which means you cannot really ask open questions, but they just have what you would get if you get a survey online where you can plug specific numbers in. Um, that's what they do with with these parliamentarians. So they know they get this um, very structured survey and they have to answer on specific scales. So they cannot really give flexible and free answers. But the benefit of it is it is that you really get the full survey response. So non-response is there, but it's not as high as with other surveys, which are administered maybe through an online link or sending it per mail or things like that. So having a person sitting in front of you face to face going with you through the survey um, increases the likelihood of um, reducing um, non-response. Um, so that's also why when I talk about it, I sometimes talk about talk call a, call them interviews, although mm -hmm. in essence those are surveys. So can you show us maybe what we can do with the actual data? What can the data show us? What insights can we gather from this particular measurement? Yes. So the first thing I did was um, this, uh, book, uh, this book chapter that you read. And um, for this, a colleague of mine, uh, Ioannis Andri Andriadis, um, we used our, our two data sets because he collected a candidate survey data set um, for the Greece case around a similar time frame and we thought this would be perfect to combine both of those surveys and talk about the benefits and pitfalls and things you could do with um, this kind of data. So we compared the case of Greece to the case of Bolivia which are actually not so often compared mm -hmm. because they are in different regions and um, um, there are not many researchers out there who do a lot of um, cross-regional um, research. And what you can see here is in this um, chapter, we show you exactly this distribution of um, parliamentarians within um, Bolivia. You have um, the seat share of the um, party of Evo Morales, for example, who is one of the um, more, more populist presidents and who's also studied a lot in the literature, um, or who was president because now he's not anymore. At that time, it was Evo Morales um, um, in Bolivia. So his party has a very nice, comfortable majority in parliament. And uh, when you look at the seat share, you have 67%. Um, and when you then look at the respondents, so we come close to this distribution. But what you can also see is that the PDC, a political party there, um, this was the party where we only got eight um, responses. So working with this data is a bit more problematic, so we have to be careful. And what we then did is we used the populism scale and um, run, um, um, mock and scale analysis, and I think this is the data for Bolivia. And what you see is that you can see if those different items load on similar factors. So the six items we talked about earlier, you saw in that table, 
um, are here abbreviated with their short um, item label. And um, running the analysis shows us that there are two different um, aspects of populism that kind of load together on one factor. And one is people centrism and the other one is anti-elitism, which also is in line with the theoretical background. We think that those are di different dimensions of populism and to be highly populist, you usually, usually should show um, higher um, degrees in both of those dimensions. Um, if you're less populist on one scale, it would be a, a bit more um, inconsistent. Um, for example, if you measure populism um, in presidents, um, one example was Donald Trump in his campaign. He was a lot more capable of using the anti-elite uh, component of populism than he was capable of using the people centrism component of populism. And I think you also talked to Kirk Hawkins in your course um, so that um, he, he might have um, given you some information on this as well. Graphically, this looks um, then like this. Um, so let's scroll down to the um, Bolivia data. So here you can see what happens if you um, divide this up among parties and look at the different um, degree of um, populist attitudes with this to these two um, scales um, with respect to those three different parties. And what you see here is a very large confidence interval for the PDC, and that's because we only have eight um, parliamentarians for this party. So we have to be really careful into interpreting this. And what I usually do and what's also done in the chapter is we focus on the um, on the comparison between the main party in government, which is the MAS, supporting President Morales, and the main party in opposition, which is the UD. And um, here you see significant differences with respect to the people centrism index. So the MAS is very high and highly um, positioned with respect to its parliamentarians on people centrism and it doesn't spread very far. So you see also that the parliamentarians are very unanimously um, pro-people in, in their attitudes. The opposition party is a bit more spread but still this, this looks fairly, um, fairly consistent with respect to the position of the political party. And you clearly see a statistically significant difference between those two groups. Um, if you look then at the anti-elite index, um, the picture reverses itself a little bit. Um, and here you have the government party amass um, spread out a little bit more and less anti-elite um, than the UDI, the opposition party. And this is a bit confusing if you if you remember and think about Evo Morales being this highly populist president. Um, how can it be that um, his party is not anti-elite? But we had, we did this survey um, where in 2014 or 15, I think it was. Um, so this was the second term of um, Evo Morales. They were already in power for several years. And over time, when you are in power, the anti-elite um, component usually reduces. It also makes sense because at some point you become part of the elite. Mm -hmm. So it's more difficult to sell yourself as a populist um, once you are in power. Um, so being in opposition has a slight tendency towards making it easier to use an anti-elite um, discourse. And this is, or anti-elite attitudes in this respect here. And this is what the UDI, for example, here did as well. So this is the opposition party. So for them, it's easier to, um, to have an anti-elite um, attitude um, or that it shows an anti-elite attitude. And do we see similar things in Greece? Um, so in Greece, the things are a little bit different. Um, in Greece, we have one factor on which this loads. So one thing we have to say that for the European cases, these uh, populist attitudes usually load um, on one um, factor. So this means you have one um, combination of uh, five or six um, items. It depends on the country. So this is also the thing that these scales not always um, are not always consistent across contexts. But with uh, with Greece, you have one populism index. So for for um, for Bolivia, you could um, argue that you have two dimensions of populism that do not always come together. And uh, when you want to generate a populism scale, you have to make the decision if you want to aggregate those two up 
or if you want to use the lower disaggregated dimensions for Greece, actually, you can clearly see that those two political parties, Syriza um, and Anel, which in the literature are also reported as the more populist parties in that country, they score considerably higher on, um, on the populism index constructed of those um, five, in, five items um, compared to the mainstream political parties. And you also can see that here, the spread is not fairly, fairly large. So those parliamentarians, or in this case, candidates, um, are also um, fairly consistent with their um, attitudes towards um, populism in a way. You mentioned earlier uh, that you might have an update of the data that you might want to share or shall we? I can show a few other graphs. So update not in the terms of that this is, um, is a later year, but what I can show is that with such a survey, you cannot just look at the mm -hmm. differences between parties, for example, but there may be other items or other questions in the elite survey. And it's a really long one with a lot of interesting questions on ideology, on political party position, on um, the perspectives of parliamentarians towards representation, towards political parties, towards um, um, Different, different aspects of social and political life, um, also their career trajectories. And, um, and so it gives you a, a very large um, opportunity to compare these populist attitudes to other things. And um, so one thing we did, for example, is not just compare political parties, but we also compared um, the ideological leaning to um, populism and this is now not very, so with a country with more political parties, this would be more interesting. Um, but here it's fairly the mirror image of what we saw before because the government party is the left party and the opposition party is the right or center right party. So merging these parties together gives you the same picture as before with government and opposition. So the um, government is actually more uh, pro-people and the opposition is less pro people and the same happens with respect to this anti-elite attitude which here is just labeled in a different way so you have um, a more anti-elite um, attitude with respect to um, the center right and a less anti-elite attitude with respect to the left and that's the mirror image other things you can compare are democratic values so if you look at the people centrism graph here in this um, picture you see that political um, parliamentarians do not differ with respect to their attitudes towards political parties um, with respect to people centrism. So even if they think parties are not necessary, they might um, still be scoring high on people centrism. And if they think parties are necessary for democracy, they also rank high on people centrism. Why is this the case? Because you can perceive of, rep of um, of democratic vertical accountability in two ways. You can perceive of this in a direct way, like direct democratic decision-making. So citizens um, do not need parties as mediators, but you can also perceive of the sovereignty of the people through representation, through an indirect way of vertical accountability mechanisms. And so here, um, this is a pattern which, which could give you some interesting insights in the, this relationship as well. Okay, Saskia, thank you very much for these uh, wonderful insights, not only in uh, your own work, but also in the broader data set. Thank you very much. Of course, happy to share. Bye.